Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, the Conservative Party chooses its new leader. Aaron O'Toole is the new leader of the, part, the Conservative Party of Canada. Congratulations, Mr. O'Toole. The key moments from an unprecedented convention. The Conservative Party will be ready for the next election. What it means for the government and the future of the party. Another record-setting jump in COVID cases in Manitoba. This is kind of that, that wake-up call a bit to, to Manitobans. Oh, look about that from Davis. How's that for confidence, eh? From refugee camp to the Champions League final, Canadian soccer phenom Alfonso Davies makes history. This is The National. For the Conservative Party of Canada, this was a history-making leadership race. It ended with a twist, an hours-long delay that frayed nerves and perhaps heightened the drama before the decision came. Early Monday morning Ottawa time, a new leader of the party was announced, Aaron O'Toole, who will now have to decide whether he wants to try to bring down the minority Liberal government and campaign for Prime Minister. So a big day for the party and also much longer than anyone expected. Catherine Cullen takes us through the drama and the delays. It's the moment Aaron O'Toole had been waiting for. And in this case, there was a little extra waiting involved. Conservative members across this country have been patient throughout this leadership race, as Canadians have been through COVID-19. While this night was about big political principles and aspirations, the hiccup came down to the machines opening the envelopes for the record of nearly 175,000 ballots. They're opened automatically by an actual machine. And what's been happening is that the machine is ripping or cutting some of these ballots. As the candidates waited anxiously with their teams and families, the outgoing leader set the bar for the winner. Next leader has to reach that next tier of Canadian voters that, uh, that, that we know are out there that are open to voting for us. We need to uh, find a way to connect. The suspense kept dragging out. They're not going to be giving us the results right away. And dragging out. It's a disappointment, of course, and it's unfortunate. It's, a, it's more stress. But I think it's, everything is uh, being uh, looked upon in a very official way. Finally, six hours behind schedule. So now the moment we've been waiting for, Dan. It took three rounds of voting. Ms. Lewis, 10,140 points. And included a strong showing from political newcomer Leslin Lewis. But in the end, it was O'Toole's night. Aaron O'Toole is the new leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. Congratulations, Mr. O'Toole. The Ontario MP ran a campaign pitching himself as a true blue conservative, often combative, speaking out against what he called the radical left and Twitter mobs. But in his victory speech, O'Toole focused on uniting the party and appealing to all Canadians. To the millions of Canadians that are still up, that I'm meeting tonight for the first time, Good morning, I'm Aaron O'Toole. You're going to be seeing and hearing a lot from me in the coming weeks and months. But I want you to know from the start that I'm here to fight for you and your family. All right, next Prime Minister. Hey, hey. That message to sign his next campaign to win the federal election has already begun. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Let's bring in our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, who's been on the air for hours. Give me a couple more minutes here, Rosie. Um, looking back at Aaron O'Toole's speech, he was smiling. He had lots of energy. Did he send the right message, do you think, with that speech? Yeah, I mean, the, the shift that had to happen tonight, Ian, was how do you go from being a leadership candidate to being the leader of the party and leader of the official opposition? So it couldn't just be the things that Conservative Party members wanted to hear, which is what we heard from Aaron O'Toole throughout uh, the campaign, and was often, uh, often negative in tone, frankly, particularly criticizing the government. Here, certainly, there was criticism of the Liberal government and things that the Conservative Party would do differently, but there was also a real appeal to uh, a broad swath of Canadians 
Canadians and perhaps Canadians that haven't looked at the Conservative Party in some time for them to try and reconsider, give the Conservative Party a second look. There was uh, parts of the speech that addressed Alberta because he realizes that there's a question of Western alienation that is still prevalent in this country and a part of the speech that reached out to uh, Quebec as well, even though he admits his French is not perfect, appealing to Quebec nationalists that the Conservative Party could be a place to call home. So in terms of the speech of a leader, of someone who wants to be prime minister one day, uh, he hit the right mark in terms of reach out to regular Canadians as well as Conservative members. So after presumably some sleep, what's <laughs> next for him and the party? Well, it's certainly easier for Mr. O'Toole because he already has a seat inside the House of Commons when the House of Commons resumes uh, for the throne speech on September 23rd. He will obviously have a prominent role there in terms of criticizing the government, holding the government to account. But we'll see some logistical changes uh, pretty immediately. He might want to move people around in their critic roles inside the uh, Conservative shadow cabinet. He'll want to get his staff in place pretty quickly. He now has four to five weeks to do that before Parliament comes back. Um, so he'll want to send some signals about uh, unity, people that he appreciates, and sort of the direction the party wants to take. And, and could that mean an election? It could, but he'll have to find some other dancing partners with the Bloc Québécois and the NDP. So it'll be interesting to see how he approaches those other opposition parties, too, as he considers what's next for the Conservative Party. Well, really nice work tonight and this morning, Rosemary. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Well, to the United States now, the Republican National Convention kicks off tomorrow in Charlotte, North Carolina, giving Donald Trump a nightly opportunity to make his case for a second term. But as Paul Hunter reports, new tape from Trump's own sister shows she doesn't think that he's fit for office. Like with Democrats last week, the COVID pandemic means the coming Republican convention will be like no other. Part of it in North Carolina part of it in and around the White House as the party gets set to nominate Donald Trump for re-election, promising an upbeat, optimistic program this week. So we're going to talk about the American story, about all the accomplishments that we've had over the last four years with President Trump and what the president's second term vision is going to look like. This weekend, near the site of the convention in Charlotte, Black Lives Matter demonstrators with an indicator it'll be a raucous few days. Indeed, from that issue to Trump's impeachment and inner circle scandals to his handling of the COVID crisis, polls show most Americans disapprove of his presidency. Trump had long pointed to a growing economy as a key argument for re-election, but COVID has turned that on its ear as well. And now, more family trouble. All he wants to do is appeal to his base. He has no principles. I'm none, none. Trump's own sister, Mary Ann Trump Barry, in secretly recorded audio out this weekend as she speaks with Trump's niece, who's written a scathing tell-all book. In the audio, Trump's sister calls him a cruel phony. The change of stories, the lack of preparation, the lying, the holy The Trump campaign today dismissed it. So this is something, unfortunately, when you get to the White House, you have family members who uh, sometimes decide to voice their sibling uh, rivalries or, or frustrations. And so to the convention, expect primetime speeches by other members of Trump's family, as well as from senior Republicans, and of course, Trump himself in front of an audience, despite the pandemic. Say convention organizers expect surprises. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. And a surprise departure from the White House tonight. Trump advisor Kellyanne Conway, one of the president's closest allies, is leaving the administration. In a statement, Conway said she will transition from the White House at the end of this month, citing a need to spend more time with family. Her husband, George Conway, is also leaving his post at the Lincoln Project, a political action committee devoted to preventing Trump's re-election. Well, let's turn to Canada's COVID-19 situation. Here's a look at the numbers on Sunday night. It was largely quiet in the east, just three new positive tests in Atlantic Canada. Quebec was down from yesterday with 74 new cases. Ontario up slightly to 115. B.C. and Alberta didn't report numbers today, but Manitoba announced an alarming uptick, a record 72 new cases, easily the highest one-day count since the pandemic began. Most of these new cases are in southwestern Manitoba, which struggles with a number of serious COVID-19 clusters, including in close-knit Hutterite communities, stoking tensions between them and the broader population. 
That region will see tougher restrictions imposed tomorrow. Austin Grabish walks us through the situation. This is kind of that that wake up call a bit to to Manitobans that we're seeing increased numbers that we need to uh, again focus back on the fundamentals. The Sunday wake up call no one wanted. Manitoba announcing the biggest spike in cases since the pandemic began. 72 new people ill with the coronavirus, the majority on Hutterite colonies. I think that it's important to look past the large number today to understand that a significant part of today's reported numbers is because there is testing going on on colonies. Manitoba health officials say they are also seeing the virus spread right now in young people and warn some have lost track of the fundamentals. There are some foolish non-Hutterite Manitobans and there are some foolish Hutterites and they all need to be told to do the right thing. Kenny Wallman is with the Hatterian Safety Council. He says COVID-19 has killed multiple people on Manitoba Hutterite colonies. And in certain communities, there were so many possible cases, healthcare workers came on site to do testing. He says Hutterites who do everything together are trying to adapt. Our communal kitchens are closed. Our daily worship services have to be reorganized. Today's numbers, a stern reminder that COVID-19 is still here. They need to mandate masks. And I was going through some of the restaurants there and I thought, oh, you know, I thought twice about it for the first time in quite some time. It's concerning and the schools are going to open, so probably going to increase the rates. Starting tomorrow, all public gatherings are going to be limited to 10 people in the affected southwestern region of Manitoba. You're also going to be required to wear one of these at all indoor public spaces, as well as at any public gathering. Austin Grabish, CBC News, Winnipeg. And officials here in B.C. are growing frustrated. Their COVID-19 safety warnings are still not being taken seriously by some. For the second night in a row, Victoria police broke up a party of young people held in the same small apartment, despite tough new fines for breaking COVID rules. Briar Stewart is tracking that for us tonight. Well, it didn't take long for officers to lay fines under new strict enforcement measures. They were rolled out by the province on Friday and designed to act as a deterrent at a time when COVID-19 cases are rising in BC. But a more than $2,000 fine wasn't enough to stop one host who had a party shut down on Friday and then another one this morning. Police in Victoria heard about the first party on social media and warned the host about being fined, but the party went ahead. Police estimate that throughout the night, there were between 40 and 60 people there, all in an apartment that was just a few hundred square feet. People were sweating. Officers that were there all noted just the amount of heat that was coming from this one bedroom suite as there were so many people in such a small space. The windows had actually fogged up and there was moisture uh, in the rooms. They gave the host a $2,300 fine. Under new enforcement measures, people can be fined if they hold an event with more than 50 people. Or even if there's a smaller group but not enough space to physically distance. They can also be fined if they don't keep contact lists for tracing. If you're uh, ignorant enough and stupid enough uh, to encourage people to attend an event and not to follow uh, provincial health officer orders, uh, then you're setting yourself up for a fine. But the large fine wasn't the end of partying at the apartment because this morning officers were called again. This time, one of the 15 guests got a $230 fine for refusing to leave. That's insane. Yeah, now's not the time to party, everybody, right? Yeah, 100%. Just stay home, get your bubble small. I think, like, there has to be big um, consequences for that kind of stuff just because we've been talking about it for so long. Now, police did not find the host for the second party, saying they can use discretion in these situations. Officials say indoor gatherings like house parties are particularly challenging to crack down on, but they're also risky when it comes to the potential spread of the virus. Ian? Briar Stewart reporting from Vancouver this evening. Overseas, a dramatic statement from the president of Belarus as protests swell. We are here to show that we never elected him. Up next, the embattled leader, defiant in body armor, toting an assault rifle. The growing, intensifying standoff. Oh, look about that from Davis. The Canadian soccer star making history on the world stage 
and he's only 19. And that out of control boat spinning wildly after its owner fell overboard into the Atlantic. He was panicking. He was saying, help, help. But this story has a happy ending. The moment is coming up. Stay with us. In Belarus, thousands have continued to protest against President Alexander Lukashenko and the election they say he rigged two weeks ago. Protesters sent Lukashenko a strong message today, but as Chris Brown shows us, the president sent them a message too. Once again this weekend, an enormous crowd of Belarusians defied their president and orders from their country's army to stay home. We are here to show that we never elected him and that we want the change, that we want the new country with a new president. But the man they want out, President Alexander Lukashenko, who's ruled Belarus for 26 years, had a message of his own to deliver. He flew over the crowd in a helicopter and then emerged in a bulletproof vest carrying an AK-47 machine gun before mingling with riot police, cheering them on. However, unlike earlier protests where demonstrators received horrific beatings, today's remained mostly peaceful. Lukashenko was re-elected two weeks ago in a vote many inside and outside of Belarus claim was rigged. He has fought calls for his resignation by organizing his own rallies. NATO forces are approaching, he said on Saturday, falsely, implying that foreign governments are the source of his problems, not unhappiness at home. Watching everything from exile in Lithuania was the woman who likely won that election, former English teacher Svetlana Tikhonovskaya. Her husband had planned to run for the presidency, but when he was jailed, she ran in his place. The Russian people will not be able to accept him as new president. You know, they will not uh, allow to treat them as they did before. The machine gun photo op is no doubt Lukashenko's way of saying he's going to fight on. Many wondered if the intimidation tactics by police and the army might signal that the opposition is losing steam. Today's large turnout suggests not. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Iranian authorities have updated their investigation into the downing of Ukrainian Airlines Flight 752. Recordings from the jet's so-called black boxes revealed only 19 seconds of cockpit conversation. 176 people were killed, including 55 Canadians. Up next, the Canadian teenage star who is tearing up the world of soccer. What a player. What a feature in the game. From a refugee camp to the Champions League final, how Alfonso Davies made history right after the break. How's that for confidence, eh? Someone with not a lot of experience, the ability to do just that in such an important game. Lots of praise today for Alfonso Davies, Canada's teenage soccer phenomenon. Today he helped a German team win one of the sport's highest honours, and by doing that he made Canadian sports history and helped soccer in this country. Here's Angelina King. Oh, look about that from Davies. Wow. Alfonso Davies, known for his speed, dribbling, and now for making history. Congratulations, Alfonso Davies. Today, becoming the first Canadian national team member to play in the men's Champions League final and to win. He was excellent. He was really, for 90 years old, he was really brilliant. He was very cool, very controlled. A Bayern Munich fan club closed out a sports bar to watch the game. I think what we need in Canada for, for soccer to grow is to have somebody on a stage for people to look up to. The next generation already is watching him in awe. He's a big inspiration to, I think, a lot of young people and especially me too. In an interview in 2018, six months before joining Bayern Munich, Davies told the National he plays in the best interest of his team while always enjoying the game. I'm just trying to develop my skills as much as possible. 
As a person, I'm a, I'm a fun guy. I like smiling a lot. Bayern Munich are crowned kings of Europe. And today, a lot to smile about. Davies was born in a refugee camp in Ghana, moving to Canada when he was five. About 10 years later, joining his first professional team, the Vancouver Whitecaps, after getting his start in Edmonton. Really nice, respectful young man, humble. Um, he's really down to earth. I mean, uh, with all of the excitement and fame, his head, you know, hasn't swelled. His former coach turned agent says when he first saw Davies play, he knew he could go pro. He was, of course, special a special player he was very quick and he just had natural touch to the to the with the ball and just the way he moved and with davies on team canada fans here are hopeful that the country might get a spot in the 2022 world cup the last and only time team canada qualified was back in 1986. angelina king cbc news mississauga ontario and the Toronto Raptors made history tonight as their quest for back-to-back -back NBA championships continues. Raptors are going to take it. Their first ever sweep. The defending An impressive victory Toronto over the Brooklyn Raptors Nets as they complete a four-game playoff sweep for the first time in franchise history. The team also setting a record for the most points it's ever scored in a playoff game with 150. They now face the Boston Celtics. Up next, a dramatic water rescue off the coast of PEI. A boat out of control, its owner fallen into the sea, starting to panic. The moment right after this. Circumstances last week. Darcy Foley was checking his oyster gear off the side of his boat when he fell into the Foxley River. That boat started spinning out of control. It ran the fisherman over, narrowly missing him with the propeller. A nearby boat spotted him. The people on board raced to help. That quick thinking rescue is tonight's moment. He was panicking. He was saying, help, help. I'm going down. I'm going down. I can't last. I couldn't take any more hits. Or I'd been gone then. We threw him a line uh, as we got closer on his last gasp, but he seemed ready to give up. Oh, wow. And just up there is where uh, we saw uh, the boat going around and around. How you doing? <laughs> Good. You're looking a little different. Yeah. <laughs> Better circumstances yeah. now. Yeah. I could see the silver boat coming, oh, at, yeah. coming at me every time I shut my eye. I didn't sleep at all at night, and the next day was rough. I'm just glad you were there. Like I can't oh. thank you guys enough. Ah. Well, like we were saying, if you know, if it had been five minutes one way or the other, we wouldn't have been there, yeah. and you'd have been. Yeah. Like I'm just thankful they were there, and <laughs> they're good people. So much to be thankful for, and you can imagine how frightening, frightening that was, especially when you consider his dad died of drowning when he, the kid, was was 11 years old. And he doesn't feel like he had much time uh, left in that water when all of a sudden he got spotted and picked up. That is the National for August the 23rd. Good night.